Today I want to speak to you on a very timely subject, and we're going to be speaking today on the subject of, Is Ukraine in Final Bible Prophecy? And I think you're going to be surprised to learn today how much of what is going on in our world was meticulously predicted by prophets out of the Bible. But I think what a lot of people are not aware of, I think we are able to see by watching news and by watching uh, various outlets as to what is going on with Russia, what is going on with the Ukraine, what is potentially going on with China, uh, what is going on with allied nations, and so on. But what most people don't know, including all of the major media outlets around the world, the Bible tells us not just what's going on, the Bible tells us exactly where this is all headed. What you're watching in Russia and Ukraine and in that uh, seemingly needless conflict is really just a backstory to a main story. And one of the things that I want to do today, if the Lord will help me, is I want you to not only understand what's going on in the Ukraine in light of Bible prophecy, I want you to understand exactly where this is all headed, because the Bible speaks clearly upon that subject. And when I say that, did you know that the Bible remarkably and accurately predicted that in the last days an aggressive leader would rise up out of the land of Russia and become involved in trying to bring back together what we might refer to as the Russian Empire? Are you aware of that? The Bible prophesied that in the last days that an aggressive Russian leader would rise up out of the north above Israel and he would begin to amass military power and his desire is not only to reestablish the Russian Empire but we're going to see exactly what the Bible prophesied as to where this aggressive Russian leader is headed. With that said, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 38. Ezekiel chapter 38. And I'm going to begin reading at verse 9. And uh, tell you what I'll do. Let me begin reading at verse 1. And uh, because of context, and read all the way down through verse 9. Ezekiel chapter 38, one of the great Old Testament prophets, beginning to read at verse 1. This is another message that came to me from the Lord. Son of man, turn and face Gog of the land of Magog. Pause right there. I will in this Bible study carefully explain to you who is Gog, and who is Magog? We'll identify that in this study, but let me read on. The prince who rules over the nations of Meshech and Tubal and prophesy against him. Give him this message from the sovereign Lord. Gog, I am your enemy. I will turn you around and put hooks in your jaws to lead you out with your whole army, your horses and charioteers in full armor and a great horde armed with shields and swords. Pause again. One of the things that the Bible prophesies as a sign of the last days is Jesus told us in the 24th chapter of Matthew that there would be wars and rumors of wars. Now some of the unlettered critics of the Bible would say what an absolutely ridiculous prophecy. There have always been wars and rumors of wars. But what I want you to know is that currently in the 21st century the pace of wars and rumors of wars 
outpaces any time in human history, and not by a small number, but by a substantial number. number. And then a lot of people are not aware of the fact that Jesus prophesied wars and rumors of wars within the context of end time signs being like birth pains. Well, what specifically does that mean? Well, all of the women that are listening to me who have ever given birth to children know exactly what it means. Birth pains increase in number and they increase in intensity. So when Jesus prophesied that the signs of the last days would increase like birth pains, he's actually giving us a twofold look to analyze all of the data. Are wars and rumors of wars increasing in numbers and are they increasing in intensity? They're increasing in numbers, but as we get closer to the rapture of the church, they will be self-evidently increasing also in intensity. And even as I say that, most of you are aware that the geopolitical strategists of the world are saying that this is a very slippery slope that we're currently on with Russia and the Ukraine. And dominoes may be falling that will lead us towards World War III. Those are not my words. Those are the words of theorists that specialize in this type of data all around the world. We'll come back to that in this study. The Bible goes on to say in verse 5, Persia, Ethiopia, Libya will join you too with all their weapons. Gomer and all its armies will also join you. Along with the armies of Beth Togarma from the distant north, and many others. Now pause again. Any time in the Bible where you hear the phrase translated in an English Bible, north or distant north, you have to remember that God's compass is Israel and its capital, Jerusalem. So Bible prophecy geographically always has Israel as the centerpiece. And what is the landmass directly north of Israel? Well, of course, we know that it's Russia. But the Bible said it would not only be Russia, it would be many allied nations with them. We'll come back to that as well and give some more teaching. Verse 7, get ready, be prepared, keep all the armies around you mobilized and take command of them. A long time from now, you will be called into action. Pause again. Notice that the prophet Ezekiel said this was not something that he was prophesying that would happen in his captivity. Uh, Ezekiel was 25 years old when he was taken into Babylonian captivity along with the nation of Israel. He was 30 years old when he was commissioned to be a priest, and that, of course, escalated and evolved into being a prophet. And as with all true prophets of God, his life was not easy. He actually lost his wife while he was in captivity, but he remained a faithful prophet of God until his death. Though the Bible does not record the details of his death, Rabbinical traditions tell us that he was actually martyred by one of the princes of Babylonian captivity because he prophesied the consequences of that man's idolatry. And because that prince was repulsed by the words of the prophet, he had Ezekiel martyred. And Ezekiel died there in Babylonian captivity. But what I want you to see is that when he prophesied, he was very clear about the timing of this event. He made it clear it wasn't going to happen with the Jews in Babylonian captivity. It wasn't even going to happen in Babylon. He said, what I'm prophesying will happen a long time from now. Now, it's also important in the context of Ezekiel's prophecy 
to remember that he's prophesying to a very specific target. He said this prophecy is against Gog and Magog. I'll define who Gog and Magog are. He's already defined that they are in the distant north, north of Israel, Russia. We're going to understand today that this was a prophecy that he said is for the distant future. He prophesied what is happening in the world as you and I are interacting with the Bible because we are living in the last days. We are living in the final moments of human history. And the Lord Jesus is soon to come. That's why I always tell you there's nothing more important in all of the world than living ready to meet the Lord. And many of you that are listening to me, in the days ahead, I know that thousands upon thousands of people, many of you are listening live, but multiple thousands will listen to this on various social media platforms. And many of you, if you'd be honest with God, and I'm not judging you, and I'm not being mean-spirited, I love you enough to tell you you're not living right with the Lord. You know it, and the Lord knows it, but I'm telling you, you need to get ready to meet God, because Christ is coming soon, and you need to put your head to the pillow every night with an assurance that if the Lord Jesus were to come tonight, it is well with my soul. And if you're not sure how to make peace with God, and if you don't have a clue as to how you go about coming into right standing with your heavenly Father and knowing that your sins are forgiven, I'm going to pray with you at the end of this broadcast. And I'm going to ask you to patiently stay with us. And you're going to have an opportunity today perhaps to change the very course of your eternal destiny. Verse 8, a long time from now you will be called into action in the distant future not in the immediate future. Ezekiel said, in the distant future, you will swoop down on the land of Israel. Once again, giving us more geographical clues as to exactly to whom he's prophesying about. You will swoop down on the land of Israel, which will be enjoying peace after recovering from war and after its people have returned from many lands to the mountains of Israel. You and all your allies, a vast and awesome army, will roll down on them, speaking about Israel and the Jewish people, you will roll down on them like a storm and cover the land, Israel, like a cloud. As we begin this Bible study Let's take a moment to pray together. Heavenly Father, once again, as we open up the sacred scriptures, we humble our hearts in your holy presence. And I ask you to equip me and to anoint me to present these biblical truths in such a way that every single listener will be able to clearly understand. I ask you to quicken their ability to learn and to receive, and to grow. I pray specifically for those who may be listening who perhaps are not living ready to meet the Lord. I pray that our time together might draw them back to Christ and that they might understand that no matter what their past, no matter what their sin, the grace of God is available to all who call upon your name. I pray that you would draw people into this broadcast both now and in the days to come and that a multitude would receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and purpose in their hearts to live ready until your soon coming. And we'll be careful to give you the praise. We take a moment and we lift up the people of Ukraine and even Russian soldiers we pray that during this time of war and conflict that the power of God would call to people 
May many in that region of the world turn to God who is quick to save and to secure. We believe that prayer changes things. We know that in the last days that you told us there will be wars and rumors of wars. And so we understand that prayer does not change prophecy, but prayer can change lives. And so we ask you to reach men and women and boys and girls with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we ask it in that name that is above every name, the name of your only son, Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. As I speak, and if you follow our ministry and our social media teaching platforms, by the way, if you don't already subscribe, all of the content we provide is free of charge. And I want you to make yourself available uh, on YouTube and also on Facebook and also on our podcast channel. I want you to follow and to subscribe. I could care less about numbers when it comes to how many people follow my ministry. But I care deeply when it comes to numbers when I know those numbers represent people who are being saved and people who are being helped and people who are hungry to learn the Bible. Let me put it to you this way. Everybody is somebody to God. And you'll just have to trust me, this ministry genuinely cares about you. I do my absolute best to help you in these last days. Don't miss what I'm about to say. If there ever were a time in your life that you needed to be a systematic student of Bible prophecy, you need to commit yourself to that right now because you are living in the pages of prophecy as I speak, like no other time in world history, we are literally living in the pages of prophecy. And if you have no understanding of prophecy, then you are going to have a difficult time in these last days. But Bible prophecy will give you hope. Bible prophecy will provide you with supernatural help on how to navigate these last days. That's why I always say I would like to be a trusted source in teaching you Bible prophecy as well as the content of the Holy Scriptures. Give me at least a year of your life, if we have a year left, but give me a year of your life, and I promise you that God will take you from where you're at, no matter how hopeless that may seem, God will take you from where you're at to where He actually created you to be. There is power in the Bible. This is not simply a religious textbook. This is the eternal, ever-living Word of the Almighty God, and all who attach themselves to it will live in His favor, and in His holy hedge of protection. Uh, I think we're all aware of the fact that the headlines of the world are currently focused upon Russia and the Ukraine, and the details uh, of this unfolding war are fluid. Uh, things happened yesterday, things are happening today, and things are going to happen tomorrow that I don't have any ability to control. But the Bible tells us exactly where this is all headed. And that's really what I want to share with you today. Did you know that there are over 44 million people who live in the Ukraine? And currently, as I speak, they're involved in a nightmare. And many of them have no hope. I've preached in the Ukraine. I've preached in Kiev. I've preached in Romania. I've preached in Russia and Kazakhstan and a lot of that world. And I have visual memories of the people. And my heart is pierced seeing what is going on. But I also know that we're on a prophetic track 
and the end time prophecies are unfolding and it's headed somewhere. Let me say it again. I've said it at least two times already. I'm going to show you not just where we're at with the Ukraine-Russian conflict. I'm going to give you the backstory from prophecy as to exactly where we're headed. Media outlets around the globe are postulating right now and wondering how far is Vladimir Putin willing to go down this dark path that potentially could lead us into World War III. The internet is trending with people asking if recent events in Russia and the Ukraine are in the Bible or in Bible prophecy, and if so, how does that apply to me? Did you know that almost everything that's going on right now in Russia and the Ukraine is directly connected to the prophecy of Ezekiel that I read to you? The entirety of this prophecy begins in Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 1 and goes all the way through Ezekiel chapter 39 and verse 24. Approximately 2,500 years ago, think about that, about 2,500 years ago, the prophet Ezekiel foretold a day that would come when, now he refers to them as Gog and Magog, along with a vast horde, a coalition of allied forces, would descend upon the nation of Israel like a storm and cover the land like a cloud. However, God himself speaks and tells us that he is going to intervene and powerfully and personally judge and defend the nation of Israel because of his everlasting covenant with them as he has done. We see that in Ezekiel chapter 39 and verse 6. There the prophet Ezekiel said, speaking on behalf of God, and I will rain fire down on Magog and on all your allies, allies who live safely on the coasts. Then they will know that I am the Lord. There will only be one weapon used by God in the battle of Gog and Magog prophesied in Ezekiel 38 and 39, and that is holy supernatural fire. He will consume immediately and swiftly all of this vast horde of allied armies who have dared to come down out of the north to invade Israel. What I want you to also see in this prophecy is that Ezekiel prophesied the wrath and the judgment that would come upon this world leader called Gog almost two millennia before he was ever born. Uh, in recent days, many of you that follow us uh, have private messaged and emailed the ministry, and you've asked the question, is it possible that Vladimir Putin is the northern prince of Ezekiel's prophecy? Well, let me answer that. Is it possible that we are watching the unfolding of Ezekiel 38 and 39 and this skirmish and war and invasion in Ukraine is a part of the puzzle headed towards officially the Gog-Magog war and Vladimir Putin is indeed that leader? Well, the answer to that is the Bible doesn't specifically say, and you know me well enough to know that I detest speculation outside of Scripture. But I can say this, it is possible. Now don't say that I said that Vladimir Putin is the Gog of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39 because I'm not saying that. 
But I am saying that it is possible because I believe we are living this close to the soon return of the Lord. Now let me help you with something before we get into a couple of questions and then conclude. Gog and Magog, the prophecy of Ezekiel 38 and 39. Gog is a person. If you're taking notes, write that down. In the prophecy of Ezekiel 38 and 39, Gog is a person and Magog is a land. Gog is a leader and Magog is the land that he rules over. And so I want that to be clear. If you understand that as we go forward in this study, it'll bring clarity and help you with your understanding. So if you haven't written that down, as a matter of fact, if you have your Bible, find a place if you have the ability to uh, write some footnotes in the margins of your Bible. Why don't you write that in your Bible by Ezekiel's reference of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Just write, Gog is the leader, Magog is the land. Are we clear on that? Gog refers to a person, Magog refers to the land that he rules over. Let me first of all ask what I believe, believe to be a very important question. And if you're taking notes, question number one, how does the Russia-Ukraine war affect me? How does the Russia-Ukraine war affect me? The Ukraine is very important for both practical reasons and also for reasons of principle to our nation and to most of the world. And the reason for that, the practical reason, is that the Ukraine is a major conduit of energy. Ukraine has incredible wealth in energy and in resources. Ukraine is actually called the breadbasket of Europe. Now many of you may not know that, but Ukraine is more than just a small piece of real estate annexed to Russia it is a land that has stood for uh, the beginning of time, but it has become one of the major players of energy on the world's stage. Our current president and his son, many of you have heard multiple news pieces going back and forth and perhaps have wondered why would our president, why would our president's son, why would certain key players in the world all have this involvement with the Ukraine because the Ukraine is the breadbasket of Europe. It is a land of incredible importance because of energy. And let me tell you something, in fact, write it down in case you're not aware of it. In our current world, whoever controls the energy controls the world. Whoever controls the energy controls the world. Another preeminent global concern is China because China is very carefully watching NATO's response. You can be absolutely certain of this fact. China is watching how NATO is handling Vladimir Putin and the Russian invasion. And you can be certain that if Putin uh, succeeds in this invasion, it will embolden China to turn around and to invade Taiwan. And it is because of this that many geostrategic theorists are speculating this Ukraine conflict is starting a domino effect that is a slippery slope that will possibly lead towards a World War III scenario. Now I will tell you that many eschatology scholars refer to the Gog-Magog War of Ezekiel 38 and 39 as a potential World War III. And to be honest with you, they may very well be right. 
it's too early to tell, but I am of the mindset that these scholars that go back many, many years uh, could very well be accurate in stating that the Gog Magog world of Ezekiel 38 and 39 could be a World War III. Now, I'm going to cover this in a, di a, a different teaching, but I do want you to write this down because it's very important. Did you know that there are two Gog and Magog wars in final Bible prophecy? There are two Gog and Magog wars in final Bible prophecy, but they are not the same wars. They are two distinct wars with two different timings. Let me explain that to you. The Gog Magog War of Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 more than likely will occur after the rapture of the church in the first half of the tribulation. Now, I'll come back to that at a later teaching, but there is much debate in the world of theology and eschatology on the timing of the Ezekiel 38-39 Gog-Magog war, but there is strong biblical support that the first Gog-Magog war, Ezekiel 38 and 39, the passage we're dealing with today, that it will culminate immediately after the rapture or sometime during the first half of the tribulation period. If you're a new student of the Bible, the next major prophetic event is the rapture. After the rapture comes a seven-year period of time called the tribulation, seven years to the exact day. The tribulation period will end with the second coming of Christ. The rapture leads us into the seven years of tribulation. The second coming of Christ terminates the seven years of tribulation. And then after the second coming of Jesus Christ, Revelation chapter 19, we move into Revelation chapter 20, which begins to talk about a 1,000-year span of time called the millennial reign or sometimes called the millennium. There is a second Gog-Magog war found in Revelation 20, and that Gog-Magog war will take place at the very end of the millennium. I'll do a teaching specifically on the two Gog-Magog wars, but let me at least uh, help you with that because I've already received multiple questions with people who are confused wondering how this fits into the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Remember, two wars, two Gog-Magog wars, Ezekiel 38 and 39, after the rapture, in the first half of the tribulation, we'll teach that at a later date, the second Gog-Magog war found in Revelation 20 occurs at the end of the millennium. Now, many of you know that Vladimir Putin is on a path of trying to reestablish the ancient Russian Empire. That's what this is all about. This is not just about Ukraine. This is a systematic path that Vladimir Putin has been on since becoming the leader of Russia. He annexed and invaded Crimea. He then maneuvered into the Republic of Georgia, and now he has invaded Ukraine and has full intentions of annexing her just as he did Crimea. What is he doing? He is doing what he desires, and that is to reestablish the ancient boundaries of the Russian Empire. That's his ultimate goal, and that's what leads us to Gog and Magog. Uh, Ezekiel not only referred to him as Gog, he referred to him as the northern prince. And again, the landmass due north of the land of Israel is Russia. And so many are speculating, is Vladimir Putin the northern prince, the Gog of Ezekiel 38 and 39? I'm not saying he is, but I'm not saying he isn't. 
I don't know the exact timing because it all corresponds to the rapture. And as you've heard me teach before, the rapture is a signless event. Question number two, what does the Bible say about Russia and the Ukraine? What does the Bible say? Question number two, what does the Bible say about Russia and the Ukraine? Well, the actual word Russia is not found anywhere in an English translation of the Bible. But in Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 2, many Bible translations refer to the prince of Rosh. The prince of Rosh, R-O-S-H. Uh, that's found uh, right down in verse 2, Ezekiel 38, verse 2, highlight that. Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh. Now, the prince of Rosh is not in all modern English translations, but it is in many English translations. And so if it's not in the translation that you're reading out of, uh, don't be disturbed by that. But it speaks of the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now, I've heard some, uh, and I'll not mention any names, I've heard some say that Meshach is Moscow and Tubal is Tablisk in Russia, those two major cities in Rus Russia. Moscow and Toblask, Meshach and Tubal. It is not Moscow and it is not Toblesk. It is referring to nations. And so if you hear uh, someone on the internet telling you that Ezekiel 38 and verse 2 is talking about Vladimir Putin and talking about Moscow and talking about Toblesk, uh, that's inaccurate. Again, Vladimir Putin may be, time will tell, the northern prince. Uh, the Bible doesn't give us enough to be uh, definitive and dogmatic on that. Uh, if we enter into uh, something that becomes uh, an apparent road towards World War III, then there'll be greater evidence. But for now, it would be premature. Listen carefully, don't misquote me. It would be premature to say that the prince of the north and the prince of Rosh, or Gog, all prophesied by Ezekiel, is Vladimir Putin, not intellectually acceptable at this time. It's also important to understand that this reference to Rosh in verse 2 is simply a shortened version of our modern word, Russia. And this can be proven both linguistically and historically. Both Ezekiel and the prophet Daniel in the Old Testament, describe Russia's end-time aggressor as descending from the north. Now, Daniel would have been Ezekiel's uh, equal. They were both prophets and almost identical in age, other than uh, Daniel was a bit older and was already well-established as a known prophet before Ezekiel was recognized as a prophet. But in Daniel chapter 11, uh, verses 5 through 35, Daniel used the phrase, the king of the north, to describe the commander of this northern alliance. In Ezekiel 38 and verse 6, look down at verse 6, Ezekiel's prophecy supports what Daniel prophesied, uh, indicating that the invading armies would descend upon Israel from the far north. And so what I want you to know without going into uh, an in-depth word study on this is Russia, write this down, Russia is the only modern nation that checks all of these biblical prophetic boxes. There's no other land, there's no other landmass that we can even speculate that this might refer to. It refers to the landmass due north of Israel, and that is Russia. And so I confidently believe 
that Rosh in the Bible is indeed Russia. Now people ask me about the Ukraine. Is the Ukraine mentioned in Bible prophecy? No, Ukraine is not mentioned anywhere in Bible prophecy, but here's what you have to understand. Boundaries of nations change throughout history. They're changing as we speak. But originally, when Ezekiel prophesied this, the land of Magog would have included the Ukraine. The Ukraine would have been a part of the original Russian Empire. That is why Vladimir Putin is systematically annexing back and invading these land masses because he is intent to have as a part of his legacy as the leader who reestablished the Russian Empire. So if Putin invades Ukraine, which he has, Russia will then achieve full stature of her ancient status as the Russian Empire. And what's important to that is that sets the stage for the fulfillment of the next move prophetically, which is the Gog-Magog War. Question number three, when will Russia start this Gog-Magog War? When is this Russian Empire who also rallies a mighty alliance of nations? The Bible refers to them as a vast horde. Well, there are many nations that are going to be a part of that invasion upon Israel, and I'll not take the time to define that in this study. I will in the study on Gog and Magog, the two Gog and Magog wars, but it's going to be obviously all of the Muslim nations in that re region. Uh, they're oftentimes called the Stan nations because almost all of those nations end with the spelling of S-T-A-N, Afghanistan, Turkestan, Kazan, uh, Kazakhstan, and so on. There's a, a whole group of Islamic nations. And what do all of those nations have in common? It's Islam and a hatred for Israel and for the Jews. But it's also going to involve parts of Africa and uh, Libya. It's going to probably involve Germany. It's probably going to involve uh, the Sudan and a, a vast horde. And again, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I promised I wouldn't identify all of those nations in this study. I'll come back to that at a later time. But we know now that Ezekiel's prophecy that Gog, the prince of the north, the prince of Rosh or Russia, will not be content when he rebuilds the Russian Empire. He will rebuild the Russian Empire and then God said, and I read it to you in those first verses. God said, I'm going to put a hook in the jaw of this leader and I'm going to lead him into this invasion. The prophet Ezekiel even uh, revealed the northern prince, the prince of Rosh, Gog's motivation for invading Israel. It was a twofold motivation. Number one is anti-Semitism. He hates the Jews, whoever the prince of the north is, whoever the prince of Rosh is, whoever the leader of Russia is at this time, whether it's Vladimir Putin or will become someone else. As I've stated, there's intelligence that's being tossed around. This is only hours old, so whether it will be verified or not, I don't know. But there is intelligence that came out today that Vladimir Putin is suffering from a brain tumor and some of his aggression and some of his activities like Hitler may be coming from a man who's not in his right mind. I don't know and I'm not going to speculate on that. But it's obvious that Vladimir uh, Putin uh, as a leader of Russia despises Israel and despises the Jews. Here's a little piece of the puzzle that you may not know. Did you know that the president of Ukraine is Jewish. The president of Ukraine is a Jew. And this probably does not help his cause with Vladimir Putin. And so Ezekiel tells us the two motives. Number one is anti-Semitism. He hates Israel and he hates the Jews. And the second is greed. He simply wants to take 
over the land of Israel and plunder all of the wealth of the nation. Uh, Ezekiel 38 verses 10 and 12. Ezekiel 38 verses 10 and 12. This is what the Sovereign Lord says, At that time evil thoughts will come to your mind and you will devise a wicked scheme. You will say Israel is an unprotected land filled with unwalled villages. I will march against her and destroy these people who live in such confidence. I will go to those formerly desolate cities that are now filled with people who have returned from exile in many nations. I will capture vast amounts of plunder, for the people are rich with livestock and other possessions now. They think the whole world revolves around him. Now again, the timing of the Gog-Magog war is debated in circles of theology. But we can almost place the weight of scholarship that the first Gog-Magog war prophesied in Ezekiel 38 and 39 will happen after the rapture or sometime during the first half of the tribulation. And there are those that argue that it'll happen immediately after the rapture. There are some who argue that it'll happen just prior to the arrival of the Antichrist becoming God in the first three and a half years when he betrays and breaks his peace treaty with Israel. We'll not get into all the facets of that debate here. Let me close with this. Where is all of this headed? Because Bible prophecy just doesn't give pieces of a puzzle and throw them at us scattered with no picture. What is going on right now, the Russia-Ukraine conflict, is a piece of the puzzle, but those of us who are students of Bible prophecy, we know exactly where this is headed. Now the world doesn't know. They may speculate. Talking heads don't know. Global news agencies don't know. Everybody's speculating and postulating where this is all headed. The Bible tells us exactly where this is all headed. There is something going on behind the scenes bigger than the Ukraine invasion, and that is the eventual invasion of Israel. When you understand that Bible prophecy revolves around the nation of Israel and God's covenant with the Jewish people, that will be a marker for you to help you better understand and look through a lens of clarity as to how other pieces of Bible prophecy unfold. And so be sure, if you're taking notes, to write that down. All Bible prophecy revolves around the nation of Israel and Jerusalem as the bullseye of that last day target. It's also very significant that Russia's invasion of the Ukraine has resulted in the Jews who lived in the Ukraine doing their best to flee the nation. I saw pictures and video and media Uh, showing the Jews that before this all came down, long lines at the airports, all trying to go where? Back to Israel. Well, the regathering of the Jewish people is the super sign of all Bible prophecy. I believe I actually have an entire Bible study just on that subject. The super sign of all Bible prophecy. And the super sign of all Bible prophecy is the regathering of the Jews from around the world back to their homeland, the nation of Israel. Already, approximately, 87% of the Jews in the world live either in Israel or in the New York City area of the United States. Did you know that? Uh, it's, It's a fluid number and it's changing as I speak. But approximately 6.9, 7 million Jews now live in Israel. How many from the Ukraine will flee there again? The Ukraine has a population of 44 million and a lot of Jewish people. So it's a fluid number. As I speak it, it's outdated. But as I speak, approximately 6.9, 7 million Jews live in Israel. About 6.3 to 6.5 million Jews live in the New York City area. 
and many of them have residence in Israel and do business in New York. And then the handful of Jews that remain are scattered throughout all of the other nations of the world. Incredible fact to know. Because it's a fulfillment of Bible prophecy to super signs. Number one, the nation of Israel has to be reborn. That took place May 14, 1948. That prophecy is fulfilled. And so the only remaining super sign is the regathering of the Jews around the world to the nation of Israel that is one of the major super signs to let us know that we're this close to the second coming of Christ, in particular, the rapture. Then seven years of tribulation, then at the end of the seven years, the second coming. And so that is also very, very important. I close with this. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, and if you have your Bible, open there with me. Matthew chapter 24, because I want you to write some of these uh, notes down and then some of these passages down. And then I also, uh, when I ask you to turn to these passages, it's because I want you to highlight what the Bible says. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 6 that in the last days that we would hear of wars and rumors of wars. Well, we are currently in a very complex war and rumor of war scenario that the world has not seen probably since the 1940s. And there's rumors of World War III as I speak. Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 7, the very next verse, that another sign of the last days would be plagues and pandemics. There has never been a pandemic in all of world history that has effectively crippled the entire planet like the coronavirus. And whether we're at the end of this is still being debated. And the economies of the most powerful nations of the world were all shut down by this pandemic. And Jesus said, one of the signs to let you know you need to live ready to meet the Lord, rumors of wars, wars, pandemics. These are all bright, flashing, neon signs to any student of Bible prophecy. But I will tell you this, prayer cannot change prophecy, but prayer can change you. Let me close with the story of a real miracle story, actually, and it's historic and well-known, and some of you will know of the details. But many in history record that the prayers of the church, the prayers of Christians, changed the outcome of World War II. Because in May of 1940, the French and the British troops were seemingly defeated. They were surrounded. Hitler's intense military campaign was rolling not only across France but all of the low countries as well to finalize what seemingly was going to be Hitler's certain victory. It seemed unstoppable and unavoidable that Hitler would have won that war. Uh, Winston Churchill along with his elite team of military strategists we're doing their best trying to figure out how can we rescue our troops that are caught and backed into a corner and are about to be slaughtered. But in their own records, in their own historic records, it is stated they had little hope that their best efforts would have resulted in less than 20,000 soldiers being rescued. Uh, King George VI called a national day of prayer in the United Kingdom on May 26th. And when he did, tens of thousands, uh, I would encourage you to Google some of the pictures, seas of people across the United Kingdom uh, filled churches, and the churches were so filled to capacity, thousands of people were standing outside the churches in many of the pictures. And they began to pray fervently for God to intervene like never before. And then a series of inexplicable miracles began to transpire following these powerful prayer meetings. Hitler gave an order to stop the armored columns driving towards the trapped 
uh, British and French troops when they were less than 10 miles away from Dunkirk. And to this day, it is unexplicable. Military writers and historians debate why. What caused Hitler to send out an order to stop his troops when they were less than 10 miles away from Dunkirk and all of the French and English troops were trapped there like rats with nowhere to go? This gave the French and English troops just enough time to gather on the shores of Dunkirk. Then the weather drastically changed. And the drastic change in the weather resulted in the German airstrikes being rendered ineffective. Then another miracle took place. The people of England took it upon themselves to organize a plan to gather every single boat, no matter how small, and begin to try to cross the English Channel to rescue whatever could be rescued. Now, the English Channel is notably uh, a powerful current in choppy waters, and the normal English Channel would never allow small boats to go from England over to Dunkirk. But on the day that they started, they awoke in the morning and the entire English Channel, from the shores of England to the shores of France, they said was like glass, not even a ripple. And miraculously, the boats were not only able to go across, but to do so at a speed which no one believed to be possible. On the exact day, May 26th, when King George VI called for a national day of prayer on the exact day, May 26th, the boats began to launch. On the national day of prayer, the waters became calm. Hitler, for some unexplained reason, shut down his forward march, allowing the soldiers to gather there on the banks in Dunkirk. And 850 commonly owned boats crossed the English Channel to Normandy to save Allied soldiers from the advancing Nazis. It was later called the Miracle of Dunkirk. Many historians refer to that in their writings. The Miracle of Dunkirk. And 338,000 plus soldiers were rescued from the beaches of France, changing the course of World War II. Winston Churchill himself, after this series of events, in a press conference, said, this is a miracle from God. After the war, the air chief, Marshall, his name was Lord Doubting, commander-in-chief of the fighter command in the Battle of Britain, made this comment, and I quote, even during the battle, one realized from day to day how much external intervention was involved to alter the sequence of events which would have otherwise occurred. Prayer changes things. We need to pray for the people in Ukraine. But you know, there are Russian soldiers that are forced to fight who are also believers and Christians. We need to pray for those who are innocent. We need to pray that God will show mercy to whom he will show mercy. But let me take that and bring it not only from the conflict in Ukraine, let me bring it right to your doorstep. Because many of you have things going on in your life that are just as drastic as what the people in the Ukraine are facing. Many of you, your life is involved in a marital war, in a war of sin, in a war of addiction, in a war of confusion, in a war of depression, in a war of divorce, in a war of financial bankruptcy, in a war of, of life changing so drastically you don't know what to do. But just as prayer changed the outcome of World War II, Prayer can change the outcome of your life. And today I'd like to pray with you. The very first thing you need to do is if you want peace in your life, you must make peace with God. 
If you want peace in your life, you must make peace with God. God is holy. We by nature are separated from a holy God because of our sinful and selfish state. But God provided a way for peace and forgiveness through His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. And today will you pray with me? Three things you must do to make peace with God. Number one, you must recognize your sin. Number two, you must repent of your sin. And number three, you must receive Jesus Christ. I want you to do that with me. And if you pray this prayer with me, I want you immediately after this broadcast to go to lostlamb.org. It'll be on the screen. And I want you to click on info at lostlamb.org. That's our email. An email and let me know. And then I want you to click on New Beginnings. And I want you to follow the prompting there because when you pray with me, this is not the end of what God's going to do. It's just the beginning. And then I want you to go to the YouTube channel and click on New Beginnings there. And we've provided several hours of teaching specifically for people who are turning from sin and turning to Christ. And it's our desire at Lost Lamb to help you. Will you pray with me right now? Let's make peace with God right here. Just say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, there's a desire in my heart to live ready to meet the Lord. And today I recognize my sin. And today I'm willing to repent, to turn my back on sin and turn my heart to Jesus Christ. I receive Him now as Lord and Savior. Jesus, your only Son, who lived a sinless life, died upon the cross for sinners, shed His blood for the cleansing of all unrighteousness, rose again, and is coming soon. Cleanse me now. Wash my mind, my body, and spirit. Make me holy in your eyes. Today I repent of sin, and I receive Jesus Christ, and I ask you to take me by my hand and lead me through these last days and keep me ready and use me to reach my friends and family is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.